What do you want that only Kal-El can give you? I... Save me. Kira, no! Well, you can certainly say this. It's always an interesting time to be Supergirl. Greetings, comic lovers, and welcome back to Casually Comics, the channel where we chat all things comics, from music comics new and old, to history, to anecdotes, really wherever our whims take us. Sometimes you get so deep into the comic book rabbit hole, you don't realize how far you've gone. I posted a panel from issue two of Brave and the Bold from the 2007 run. It features Kara and Hal, and Kara hitting on Hal rather aggressively, and Hal turning her down but being very awkward about it. To me, it was humorous and a culmination of the two's awkward histories coming together in the worst way possible. But it elicited a variety of responses and started some interesting conversations and started me down this path of musing and potentially the idea that some people needed more context, they needed to know more. I specifically got focused on Supergirl and how she was depicted during this era, which was shortly after her resurrection or return to the DC universe after having been dead. This era of Supergirl has been dubbed by some as the teen girl fetish era. It's not the most flattering of descriptions. Does it hold weight? We'll do a brief overview and take a look at this issue in particular that I posted about. Just what led to Kara being portrayed the way she was in this issue. For those unfamiliar, we're going to take a look at how Supergirl was reintroduced into the DC Universe. She's the real Supergirl, not the 90s Supergirl who was a combination of Matrix and Linda Danvers. It was interesting. It was a loophole for there still to be a Supergirl comic even though she died. Now this topic can get a little heated, a little spicy, so some disclaimers and of course the promise that we can still laugh and we can have conversations. Nuance lives here. This is in no means meant to be an all comics need to be one way or all women or all female characters in comics need to be a certain way, or all women in general need to be a certain way. No, we're just taking a look at Kara, her history, and this era of Kara. It's also not meant to get mired down in pedanticism surrounding ages. It comes up because it comes up in this specific issue. And of course, as always, it's about fun and discussing and pondering. That disclaimer will be ignored by some, but I gave it. It was there. I'm Sasha, and let's talk about Supergirl. The Kara Zor-El version of Supergirl has a fascinating and oft times confusing history. For being tested out in concept as a dream girl for Superman as imagined by Jimmy Olsen, which we did a video about, Jimmy and the Magic Totem, fantastic. Then we got to her proper origin as Superman's long lost cousin. However, Kara's history has been plagued with people clearly not knowing exactly what to do with her. Or when they do know what to do, her being trapped by an inability to truly progress in a world of perpetual, never-ending stories. That can be compounded by the aforementioned lack of focus, or from people focusing on other characters and not viewing her as important. That's how she died. So she's one of those characters who often ends up being reset as a result. Despite this, Supergirl is a character with a distinct presence and voice, and a strong fan base, and she feels like she can and does have the potential to exist independent of Superman even as she wears his logo. We've covered a few of her solo outings, both the 70s and the 80s, both showcased even if the 80s series was far stronger than its 70s counterpart that Kara can function as an independent solo character, and that she can be interesting and have a bunch of stuff going on outside of just boys, even though boys were a factor in both, especially the 70s series, which had the tagline in my video, and then you never saw him again. And even when she wasn't featured in solo runs, she was consistently a core feature from when she debuted, be it eventually leading adventure comics or as a part of the Superman family. We have a Supergirl playlist, link down below. We even went over all her different costumes, fun times. Her death in Crisis on Infinite Earths in 1985 was met with lamentation, although some some claimed that nobody cared about her until she died. As a result of this, a convoluted method was utilized I briefly described in the 90s to bring her back. But the true Supergirl, in quotes, would return in 2004 in a story titled The Supergirl from Krypton, which is a callback to the name of her first story when she debuted in 1959. And her initial depiction, well, it had some undercurrents. Supergirl has an unfortunate history of finding herself in awkward romantic and fantasy situations. And oft times they end up feeling like authorial fantasies and not necessarily just what's happening for the good of the story. Sometimes they're hilarious and off the wall madness, like Comet the Super Horse. Other times they're little moments that betray glimpses into people potentially wanting a bit more out of Kara than superheroing. In her first appearance in Action Comics 252, which was written by Otto Binder with art by Al Plastino, her original origin saw her arriving after Clark and younger than him, cut and dry. She had lived with survivors on a hunk of Krypton thrown out into space. That was for years until it eventually became unstable and then her parents sent her towards Earth. She had already seen Superman because they'd seen vid images of him on the planet. Hence, they styled her costume after his in hopes he would recognize her as from Krypton. And after they talk for a little bit, they quickly realize that they're cousins. Clark makes some remarks about his young cousin after he sends her to the orphanage and she has to pick a name for herself. She chooses the name Linda Lee because she heard those names and she liked them. Eventually, she would be Linda Lee Danvers after she was adopted. When she announces this, Clark thinks, Lana Lang was my girlfriend when I was Superboy and Lois Lane replaced her when I became Superman. By sheer coincidence, she picked the same initials. LL. No Superman. No looking at your cousin 
as a potential girlfriend replacement. Also, don't call them replacements. This came up a couple of times in the Silver Age, and it even peaked its head out again in the 2000s. There was a version of Linda that married Superman. It was supposed to be a wrap-up for the Silver Age version of Kara. And then there were some Infinite Crisis stories that happened later on in the 2005 solo run that ran after she reappeared. People keep coming back to it. Those are stories for other times. We actually have enough that we could do a list of times that alternate versions of Clark or Kara have been together. I went so far without interchanging Kara or Kara and then I mixed it up. I knew it was gonna happen, but I made it longer than I thought I would. Now outside of this, for a comic book character, Kara's love life is pretty standard. Boys at high school, later university, then on the team she's on. And while overall for her leading up to her return, there could be moments of cake, it was more of your standard variety, which for some miles will vary on, as to whether it was the usual amount or as to whether they want it there or not. It must also be known that the values and perceptions of adulthood and teenage them and how they were lived and experienced have changed quite drastically in the span of decades. So there are some shifts to be pondered, discussed, or at least brought up when it comes to the topic of Supergirl and her relationships, as to how they've been portrayed over time and who she's been paired with over time. Now, Crisis on Infinite Earths in 1985 attempted to streamline the DC Universe by collapsing everything into one timeline and one universe, and it didn't exactly end up working, and it was still confusing in some areas, and the Supergirl area was one of them, especially when they greenlit a new series even though she died. Ultimately, even before DC brought back the multiverse, they decided to bring back the original Supergirl, and they decided to go back to the classic origin, Clark's cousin, keep it simple. Oh, the multiverse, the gift that keeps on giving, even though sometimes you wish it wouldn't. Supergirl returns in Superman slash Batman number eight, written by Jeff Loeb, with art by Michael Turner. Her arc would comprise of six issues. Kara's ship crash land on Earth, and someone loved the Terminator because she comes out in a very Terminator-esque fashion, naked, wandering around, speaking Kryptonian, having to fight some people for a trench coat, which they end up using more to emphasize the fact that she's naked than hide it. Also, she didn't even get boots. Come on. And your clothes, your boots, your motorcycle. Give them to her. Really, please. In later runs, it would be retconned out that she was nude when she arrived. Even in panels where she's sad and crying in this issue, there's still cake. Now, as mentioned in the past when we've talked about cake or fan service, everybody has different thresholds as for how much is too much, or at what point it detracts from the story or enters distracting territory or exploitation territory or uncomfortable territory. Now, Michael Turner is known for drawing the female form in a particularly cheesecakey way. So it's to be expected from his work. However, there is a lot of it in these issues and most of it ends up directed at Kara. And so if you end up starting to view this through a certain lens, it can have some uncomfortable vibes. This is Kara zor my cousin from Krypton. The way these panels are framed, it just wants you to stare at her and oogle and have that peekaboo, ooh, almost so close. What if that cape fell down? Clark is an inspiration to so many, rather than Superboy. And the dog, he's never had to be responsible for someone so young. That's how I see Kara, as a child who needs our help. When you have lines like that, and panels like the one that happened before, there's a correlation being drawn potentially unintentionally or potentially entirely on purpose. So Kara's origin is slightly different here. She was still sent in a rocket, but she was sent directly from Krypton as it exploded. At this point in the history, there aren't any other survivors or living for years in a floating chunk asteroid city, but her ship got stuck and ended up attached to an asteroid for years. And she traveled with it stuck in suspended animation and hibernation. So completely in stasis, not aging or growing, neither physically nor mentally the entire time. But she did do some extra rotations around the sun, which is how she ended up arriving after Clark and being younger than him, even though she would have been older if she'd arrived at the same time as him. However, some technically count these extra rotations that she did around the earth and add them to her age, despite the fact that she didn't age physically or mentally. It's more something of the loophole variety. You certainly have the shopping part of being an earth girl down. Now, the storyline of Kara's return is a good one. Clark and Bruce aren't sure if they should trust her. Is she a plant? Was she created in a lab like Superboy? And Kara, for her part, doesn't understand earth. She doesn't feel human like Clark, having no connection to it. And she has a very us versus them mentality. She doesn't understand why he's not more Kryptonian and has a hard time relating to him. Oh yeah, I remember thongs above lowrider pants. Please don't let that style come back. Kara ends up being trained with the Amazons for a bit. Artemis specifically, and I'm so distracted by this impractical butt exposed cutout. I'm too confused to be aroused. Why is that cutout there? If, if this, is this a thing? Now Kara gets kidnapped by Darkseid and goes through a whole Dark Jasmine transformation. Darkseid even got some sweet dark eyeliner so she could do a black smoky eye. You've got to have the apocalypse aesthetic if you're going to live there. You have to suffer properly with dark eyeliner. The Supergirl from Apocalypse. With your death cousin, my life here begins an apocalypse. What did Darkseid offer her? Darkseid is a good salesman, apparently. The panel of Superman punching her with the crypt
Sabbath night ring on is pretty awesome. What do you think? I think you had the most obviously purposely accentuated cheesecake moments in this whole arc, including a scene where Big Barter was in a towel, proving that it could have been executed more subtly, circumstantially, or even tastefully. I like my uniform. I'm glad my mom made it for you. That's a sweet callback, but I do not believe that for one second. Ma Kent made that uniform. I believe it as much as when they said that all her clothes were bought for her by Lois. This story is solid, and there's a lot of love for the idea of Supergirl here. The whole arc is about Kara having to decide who she wants to be for herself, and Superman and Batman having to let go of their own baggage to let her do that. There's even some fascinating comparisons that Batman makes between her and Jason. The whole superhero community welcomes her in panels that harken back to a similar moment celebrating her arrival on Earth in the Paul Cooperberg 80s run. The whole thing ends with a sweet dedication to the late Christopher Reeve. On the whole, they're very solid issues. And it was a strong way to bring back the original Kara, or introduce her to a new audience, potentially. The emphasis on her body, though, and the insistence on the amount of fan service surrounding her does at times distract from and detract from the story. It creates this kind of fetishistic bubble at moments where it feels like the focus should be on something else, something important emotionally for the story. But instead, the focus is placed on how hot she is and less on how cool of a character she is. It can be both, but there should be a balance. And then you add in how the characters keep referring to her as a child, and it can feel pretty squicky. There's a lot of fan service during the Lobe era. A lot of skirts that are obviously showing things if the camera panned around even a tiniest bit. Or just, you know, naked with hair covering boobs or shower scenes. And also return to some of that Clark pairing stuff, but with alternate universes. There's one from her 2005 series I just, I had to show, it haunts me. What do you want from me, true child? What do you want that only Kal-El can give you? I, save me. Kara, no! I'm sorry, is this the no? Kara, no! No multiverse incest, please, Kara! I mean, this panel, there's fan service and then there's self-service. Here's some Superman service from this arc for people who felt a bit left out. Tangent time, because it's gonna come up, I know. We've talked about Nightwing before. Nightwing's butt. We did a whole video about it. Nightwing is often the focus of tongue-in-cheek and overt cheesecake. Not beef, because it's not the muscles we're focusing on, even if the butt is toned. Some may feel these moments of Kara should be treated with the same air of fun that Nightwing seems to be treated to. Do you view it as such? Or is it different not just because of the ages, but because of the gender slash sex? Or the different historical connotations, both real world and in canon, that can influence one's viewpoint, or some feel make a tangible difference? Do you feel there is different power in different gazes? Or that to treat one differently gives one group more agency than another? Or for you, is it situational, just sometimes it can go too far? It definitely goes too far with Nightwing at points. Way too far. We're exploring all these different questions because depictions like this and as they're layered on top of each other, they can have an impact on future stories or on how future stories are read. Past stories too, it can go in all directions. That's what happens when the universe is interconnected and so long lived. Which brings us finally to Brave and the Bold number two by Mark Wade with art by George Perez. This Brave and the Bold run was called The Brave and the Bold and it calls back to the original Brave and the Bold run. Initially running from 1955 to 1983. Like that, this is a team up book. And this time it wasn't just team ups with Batman. That's what it transitioned into in the original run. It eventually just became Batman Brave and the Bold. Now for the first few issues of this new run, the story had an interconnected format, an overarching story, and you would follow the heroes along it. It ran for 35 issues overall before being cancelled. There was a 36th solicit, but it was never released, and it haunts me. Like how Kal-El's hand covered all of Supergirl's butt in that panel. It just sits there in my mind. I'll forget other important things, but that'll stay there. Now the first issue that led into Green Lantern and Kara meeting was a Batman and Green Lantern team up. This involved Bruce and Hal having to go to Vegas together. This is because they both found the exact same corpse. Hal found in space and Bruce in the Batcave. There are actually 64 corpses. All of them died of the same wound and have a weird radiation trace. They're aliens and one had a Vegas card in the pocket and so they go there. This victim was Drake in his first and only appearance and he was dating Roulette. This plot ends up being quite complex. Drake was an alien himself and he was hired by other aliens to secure a book that after reading he became concerned would fall into the wrong hands. So he was trying to warn the heroes about it but got killed before he could. And because he could duplicate himself, that was his ability, the one shot killed all of them. These aliens from the planet Ventura. This book in question is the Book of Destiny. It shows all that will be. So yeah, they should probably go get it. So that's our setup. Issue two. Hal is in space looking for this book and Supergirl has been assigned to help him. Why? Cause they never really explain why she's there with him. She just is. Cause we need two heroes on this team too. Guess Superman really didn't want to hang out with Hal again. There was an interesting period of their history where the two didn't really get along all that well. Hal's relationship with other heroes is very interesting. I'm all, Cal, this sounds cool. Let's go. And he's all, Kara, this volcano is not going to put itself out. And he's so whatever. And it's like his eyes make a noise when they roll back in his head. I hate that noise. And enough about me. You've been 
everywhere. That is so my style. I can't believe we've never hung out before. I mean, I can, suddenly vapid teenage girl Kara. Listen, if Hal doesn't hang out with Ollie while he's on Earth, who is going to punch him in the face? We then get those panels I posted where she starts flirting with him, asking for his real name, teasing him about being on duty, trying to pull in, I'm cold, can I borrow your sweater? In space? In space, no one can lend you a sweater. Maybe we can share your aura? Maybe you can go drink some water? So, Green Lantern, tell me, what does a man like you do for fun when the mask comes off? It does come off, right? I did laugh at the commenter who posted, no baby, the mask stays on. <laughs> Listen, the book started it. Now there is story potential here, and it's not too mind territory. Having to fend off uncomfortable and unwanted advances from someone inappropriate that could get you into trouble, even if you rebuff them, is an interesting and complicated story. There's a lot of untapped avenues there. It's a plot that's more often explored from the other side, and not too well explored from that side either. It also could be done in such a way that both the characters come off better for it. The thing is, this is also a complex storyline that probably shouldn't be dumped into an action adventure format where the character is just going to swap out next issue. Now while some may feel Hal even seemingly entertaining the thought with his you have food in the fridge older than her or she's 17, no bad thoughts is too much, others may feel it's a funny joke and a human moment, an intrusive thought he pushes aside to do the adult thing as the adult in the situation. Others will feel he gives it too much thought because this comic is bringing the real world dynamic into it by specifically highlighting her age over and over. Over. It's presenting itself that way, lending itself to be interpreted through that lens. Hal is no stranger to having this plot thrust upon him, and for it to be horribly written while it's happening. The Arisia plot, wherein a 14-year-old ages herself up physically to match her alleged actual age based on the orbit of her planet, they argue her age would be chronologically different. Even though she had always been depicted mentally as well as physically as a little girl, actually started off under Len Wein as a thoughtful plot. It was about how she had a crush on Hal, and Hal always viewed her and treated her as a sister, and was trying to let her down gently, but also established clear boundaries and let her know that it wasn't okay. She also viewed him as a mentor figure. It was a really good opportunity to explore a platonic male-female mentor-mentee relationship. He did not express interest in her in that way. And then Steve Englehart took over the book, Writer Shift. And all of a sudden it was, she aged herself up and then they're in a cave and then they're making out. Character consistency, what's that? She's hot now. I, salt. I have lots of salt about this plot. Not just because of how it happened, but because of how it's remembered. How it gets remembered as a creep when it's actually an example of extremely poor writer changeover that made that happen. And then they stuck with the plot. Ugh, we're gonna get to that eventually in another video. When it comes to this issue, Hal recaps what happened last issue as she clings to his arm in space. They're headed off to Ventura, which it turns out is basically a Vegas planet. Hal manages to find a hilarious disguise. 10 out of 10, I demand this disguise regardless of the planet. So basically the Ventura in here has the book because he wants to cheat. Yeah, the sense of urgency between issues changes drastically. They don't flow the best one to the other. But as our thief is looking at the book, it changes. So destiny is not set in stone. But we can't keep looking at him. There's a crush plot that won't go away. Well, if anyone can come up with a plan, you can. I can see one bubbling up in those big brown eyes of yours right now. Okay, stop. Stop what? A girl can't make conversation? Hal tells her no in no uncertain terms, but it kind of starts to slip here a bit. You think... I'm a child. Oh God, Kara, that's my problem. Yours is different. Even boys you've never met know what that S represents and who's gonna come after them if they break your heart. Batman. Also, not if they meet her in her civilian identity. This sounds like a you problem. Have you thought about Superman beating you up? By adding that last bit on there, it steers the feeling a bit. This line also reframes Hal's objections to make him seem more worried about the consequences than her age. This story chose to have this subplot as the focus. It didn't have to be. It could have been anything. But it shows this and it doesn't really have the time to address it with the complexity such a topic warrants. And it feels like an odd choice when you see how it all culminates. Supergirl's feelings are hurt and so they were trying to come up with a plan to draw their mark out where they could get him in the open. So she decides she's going to go on this gladiatorial combat show that they have. And she does so dressed in a too small baby girl dress with her hair in pigtails with a plushie. And the light on Hal's face makes it look like he's blushing. So they try to play this like, yeah, she sure showed him. And she's showing him this by making herself an exaggerated version of a little girl, but it's also supposed to double as making the audience underestimate her. But why would it? They're aliens. Why would these references matter? This is directed at Hal. Or a wink at the audience. Supergirl actually winks at Hal in the audience. And when taken in with all of how she's depicted in this era, if you're aware of it, and even potentially if you aren't, this can be read several ways. It has strong, I'm a bigger girl than you think, daddy vibes, particularly when they do this upskirt panty shot. 
twice. This is not the king shame what happens between two consenting adults. We're looking at this story specifically. And this story, again, while this is happening, starts stating her age. It gets to the point where the fact that they're stating it so often starts to feel odd. Now the plan as it stands was to create a scenario where only someone with the Book of Destiny would know to bet on her. This plan could have worked without her dress like this. It could have worked in her original costume. She already looks young and girlish and people tend to underestimate her in it anyway. It still would have proved her point. Now some view complaints on Supergirl's costume or lack thereof as misogynistic or prudish. Why can't a girl be out there as she so pleases? Leave Supergirl's miniature belt alone. It's fashion. Well some argue that in theory yes, but it all depends on context. And that it's less the costume more the way the character is being framed in it. And examining each character in their place and time. And that with Supergirl there are many factors, such as her in canon age, which in this story they keep bringing up. It's not like she's Power Girl. Then there are questions as to who is producing the comic and more. Also from a story perspective, this whole sequence very much undermines a lot of the message. By moving it from Hal trying to be responsible or Supergirl having feelings that she's not sure how to navigate to see, he's wrong. She's not a girl. Not yet a woman. Just why portray either of them like this? It's an odd choice. This is meant to be their first proper meeting and team up. Now, of course, miles may vary. One may find this well handled or more of a fun take on the topic. Just a silly adventure and one shouldn't read too much into it. And that's all harmless. They're fictional characters or that fiction can be a safe space for certain fantasies to be explored. 17 but really clever. Hal, stop it. You don't have the track record for this. And then they end up being separated and she gets trapped in Ventura and he gets sucked away. These to meet up again later in the six issue arc and none of this is brought up or mentioned because well, there's no time and the story remains unchanged. On the whole, this Brave and the Bold run picked up once it stopped being interconnected and became more episodic in nature. However, these opening forays are interesting from a team up perspective. It's trying to do something big. It just doesn't always land. And of course, for the first 10 issues, you have wonderful art by Doris Perez. Overall of the first arc, which is six issues long, issue two is arguably the weakest of the bunch overall. Yes, partially because of the subplot. Overall, this era of Supergirl in general, from her re-entering the DC universe in 2004 to the New 52 in 2011, felt like it had moments that went out of their way to sexualize and objectify Kara more than the norm. I'm cutting it off there because then at that point the canon changes and it becomes a kind of different depiction of Supergirl. You know, we redo origins again and all that stuff. It just feels like there's more going on here at points than the expected or in some cases anticipated or hoped for amount. Though with how intense Hence it was at the start of her reappearance, some may have developed a hypersensitivity to it. Or some may feel that that's just always happening with Kara. It can end up, if one notices it or is bothered by such things, taking away from her stories, as it can either pull focus or lead to plots that work in some baity kind of plot elements. And so some stories can end up feeling more focused on this wish fulfillment than on having a cool plot. You can balance fan service and plot and character. I've seen it done. The legends are true. You can also have a more brazen overt sexuality or sensualness or flirtatiousness be worked into the core of a character character in a way that works and is fun. Fun for the whole family. But a core part of Kara's character at this point is that she doesn't really know who she is and she's not really sure how to act or how to fit in. Nor is it play like this is something she's trying to figure out because she's usually just being looked at. This is something that's just happening the way the panels are framed or the story isn't actually about her. Like how this tale is actually more about Hal than her. It's his thought bubbles we get, not hers. It felt like the whole story in this instance was just an excuse to get her into this outfit. Maybe she talked to Power Girl and heard that he'd slept with her and was like, I want to know about that. She was presented as very flirtatious when she first appeared, which in and of itself is not a negative. It's more the manner and tone in which it's presented at times. When these things recur over and over again, they start to feel like a pattern. There was a really solid story possible in this particular Brave and the Bold issue, which could have provided deep character moments for both of them, even in a story this short. But that's undermined by not only how it's handled here, but her overall presentation in this era and Hal's history with Arisia. That's not to say she had no good stories during this time because she did. But it seems clear why some later creators made changes to some of these origins or the costume and the like and the way they presented her. This is also not to say that Kara should never have a romance plot or show any skin ever. I will cry if I never get a story as much of a hot mess as that Comet story. It's again just saying that it's not always being handled well. And with her age being placed out there front and center, it does bring up topics for discussion. Perhaps some more couth could potentially be employed. It doesn't always feel like she's being leered at the same way. It really depends upon the creators involved. For some it's just a feeling and I know it when I see it type deal. Well, others will argue, no, you're just projecting or what are you talking about or so what? Personally, I do think an argument can be made that she's being more heavily fetishized in the early points of her return during the revival era than she is later on where it calms down to the realm of what you would expect and how it is for all characters. But that's just my opinion and I want to hear yours. Do you feel like there's a time and a place for depictions like this? Or do you feel that for some characters it's just inappropriate? Do you feel like it's entirely fine? Was it something you never noticed? Do you feel all is fair and cake and war? 
explore? Is there a line when it comes to such things? And if so, where is it for you? That made a book of destiny. And this issue was about how worrying that Superman would beat him up if he made a move on Kara. Also that he should really clean out his fridge. There was also a shot at Ollie in there, but we don't have time. So as always, tell me things and please have fun down below. We can have serious discussions and fun at the same time. Let's make the legends true and do all the YouTube things. Like, share, comment, subscribe, and hit the bell notification so that you never miss a vid. Thanks so much for taking this time your day spent discussing comics with me. I always appreciate it and I will see you again soon. Ooh, one last question. What's your favorite Supergirl era? Tell me. Bye-bye.